that I'm in trouble. I guess it's not too fuzzy. Um, I do I use my computer because I have GIS, so we can look in more depth at any of these. I didn't know how much. I suspected that there was a variety of it, of of real on the ground knowledge on the canyon. Probably some folks know every crick and cranny. Others may just be generally um, familiar with places. But just kind of moving up the canyon, Midgley Bridge, and I've got these color coded. So these are all s historic sites, um, or at least have a historic component. Some also have prehistoric artifacts at them too. But if it's been determined eligible, it's red. If, it act if it's actually listed on the National Register, that's purple. Um, if it's not eligible, it's green and unevaluated. A lot of stuff that we just haven't taken the time to evaluate and consult on um, just stays unevaluated. But as we come up, um, Midgley Bridge is listed. Uh, Grasshopper Point is not eligible. That's one of these sites that uh, there just was hardly anything left of. It was dozed out, I think, in the 60s. And so if you find historic trash there, don't worry about it. That whole site has been determined not eligible, There's, so we don't need to protect it. Um, coming but are up, you saying that if they found a can that was over 50, that it's okay to throw it away? At Grasshopper Point. At Grasshopper Ooh. Point? Okay. Yep. So for that one That's, location, you can throw everything you find. Yep. And, but and anywhere it, else, we need to do the other protocol of a picture, a GPS, and report to you. Yeah, I hate to confuse things, but I kind of want to give you Grasshopper Point because there's so much trash, and I do know that all the his anything significant of a historic value was taken out. And so that's one that here in the office I'm comfortable saying you can pick anything else up. So that old rig there, that old vehicle that looks like a um, Ford, I don't know, a, have you determined that that's not of interest? I haven't looked at that one. Technically, we don't have to protect it. Okay. So, like, if, if the historical society wanted it or something, we could remove it. Mm. I, I wasn't really thinking about that because I'm assuming they're not going to take a hacksaw down and cut it apart right. and put it in a hefty <laughs> yeah. bag. I was just interested. Okay, cool. So I hadn't tackled that one. I guess I should think about it for a second more. Um, but some of these others, even though they're not eligible, you know, if you want to do a cleanup there, just check with me beforehand um, because there may still be things that are interesting that we want to protect even though we're not legally bound to. Um, so, J.J. Thompson, 1876, that's Indian Gardens. That was the very first homestead. Um, the only piece of that that's on the forest is, this, is the spring house. Most of the actual homestead is on private, and from what I understand, most of it has been removed. But we do have the cool spring house. Um, then, Jesse Purdyman homesteaded a site there that's not evaluated. Um, I just threw out some of the names that people might be interested in. I believe this was Jesse's first piece that he homesteaded. Um, I talked about Mayhew Lodge. Um, it's a it's a complicated one, and unraveling these histories is really really tough um, because these homesteads, the way they were they were claimed and filed, overlaps, and so um, you'll hear about Bear Howard. He was a character of Oak Creek history. Uh, he was a bear hunter. He used to go um, sell bear skins up in Flag. He mm -hmm. was a uh, convicted killer. He had, it was a passion of crime. From my take of reading it, it sounds like um, people were fairly sympathetic to him, but he had legally committed murder. And so um, the guards didn't put a whole lot of energy into watching over him, and he was able to escape, I think, twice. But anyway, he escaped from prison and took the pseudonym of, of Bear Howard and lived here, brought his family here, and as far as we can tell, was a fine, upstanding citizen for quite a number of years. Um, so he lived in, and, and it just gets really messy here. The Owens had squatters rights there. I think Purdyman's had squatters rights and I'd have to get back into it. Maybe somebody has it fresh. The transition of of who was there first and, and I think it was Owens that let Bear Howard live in one of the old buildings out back kind of thing. And that's all kind of on that Mayhew piece. I mean it stretches all down the creek on that side. Um, but a lot of history right in that spot. And then we get called the canyon which um, 
even though they're both at the same parking lot, they're technically different sites. Historically, they were different things. Mayhew was an overnight lodge. Call of the Canyon was primarily a day use site. They had a big swimming pool. Uh, my family talks about going swimming there in the 40s and 50s. Um, got, I've got old postcards. It was called the most beautiful pool in America. Um, they had little little bathhouses and stuff. And they eventually did start renting cabins and stuff like that. But they were more day use. Um, the Cave Springs campground, apparently somebody tried to, to homestead it. I have in the records that there was an old ranch and old trees from an orchard. Um, they were never able to prove up on that because that was actually railroad land. Another weird thing. Whole chunks of this canyon, even though you could never conceive of putting a railroad in, was claimed by the railroad. And so um, that couldn't be proved because that was actually railroad land and then the Forest Service eventually acquired it um, back. Um, and then the Pine Flat area, uh, originally Harding, <coughs> homesteaded a huge piece in there eventually filed on the southern part, which eventually became the Chipmunk Lodge in Troutdale. And there's just lots of mysteries. Like, um, we knew that, that uh, Pine Flat was a CCC campground. A number of the campgrounds were built by the CCCs in the 30s. Um, and so we were doing a survey for a burn, an archaeological survey for a burn, and started looking across the creek and started finding um, Names scratched on rocks, I mean, not scratched, I mean, like, chiseled in. Um, and then we started finding house foundations. And finally, we figured out that it was a wreck residence where people could get leases, generally for 100 years, and you could go build your summer cabin. And so the west side of the creek at Pine Flat was a big subdivision back in, like, we're guessing the teens and 20s. Um, that was something the Forest Service did do throughout the country. Um, and then we eventually decided that that wasn't really the best use of land, giving an individual right basically to occupy and almost own that land exclusive of everyone else. So we quit doing that and closed a lot of those out. There are still a few on um, subdivisions around. We even have one up on Mormon Lake. But we got rid of this one back in the, like the 30s and had no record of it. So there's a lot of mystery still up in the canyon, and that's why we just want to be conservative, because we never know when one little thing just strikes us odd, and we start looking around and digging into it, and finding things like a whole subdivision we didn't know about. Um, so I know I'm hitting the end of my time. Are there any questions? Does that kind of give you guys some guidance on <laughs> what you can pick up and, and what not to pick up and then kind of clouds a whole bunch of middle ground for you probably. <laughs> for the foundations, like what would you look for if you came across that? It would be pretty obvious if you found them? Yeah, because they're, they're concrete and rock and, and um, people who really know concrete, old historic foundations, the concrete is looks different, it's whiter, it's sandier, it has a different consistency, um, particularly pre-World War II. Um, and so we can, we can sometimes make some guesses about rough dates, but generally when we find foundations, then we have to start finding other artifacts to figure out what was it, when does it date to. Um, but like here in the subdivision, we started finding broken pieces of old iron water lines sticking out of banks and you know, lots of little things that individually wouldn't mean anything and, and had I mean, people have been walking, archaeologists have been over that before, but never, always on the way to something else, never stopped looking at it. But we found a few of these weird things and then looked at the whole pattern and realized what we had. Mm -hmm. So this 50-year rule that, that floats. <laughs> so I can imagine in 10 years, you know, we picked up, 10 years worth of stuff that you're not going to find in 10 years. <laughs> and you have two schools of thought. Some people will say, let's get while the getting is good and clean all this crap up because it's not important. And then you have the people who are really history buffs and are like, no, don't do that. Let's just leave it so that it's all there. And yeah, the environment looks like trash, but it's important. <laughs> And, and people value different things. Like I mentioned, people, archaeologists specialize in prehistoric or historic. 
I just have a a a bent towards the prehistoric, and and my value system, I value it more. I know people who don't care a thing about archaeological prehistoric sites, but they just love any piece of rusted anything. That's really valuable, and they think it should be protected. And culturally, that that's American heritage to them. This can. I mean, there's nothing better than that can to some people. <coughs> and so we as, as the Forest Service, as agents of the public, and, and you as volunteers for us, working as the Forest Service, we just have to do our best to protect it all, even though we may not personally value any particular part of it. That's, that's what we're tasked to do. And so my personal inclination Anything that's 1965 or newer, I'd bag it all up right now, mm -hmm. because I'm not historically minded in my in my thoughts. We can look in a book and learn about that. I mean, we have that so well documented now. Mm -hmm. I think we're kind of moving past archaeology, but there's been a, a project going on for decades down at the University of Arizona. You've probably heard about it, where um, an archaeologist tested that theory, and and anthropologists all know that what we what we think about ourselves and what we say we do is entirely not what we do. We have a totally constructed view of our reality. And so they um, did a long-term excavation, may still be going on, in one of the big city dumps down at Tucson, in the modern park. And what they found, approaching it archaeologically with an outsider's perspective, is we don't do what we say we do. Even looking at trash from the 80s and 90s, they learn all kinds of stuff <coughs> about human behavior that we had not documented because we don't think we do that. So there's the argument that it's all valuable and we shouldn't scurry around picking up 1966 beer cans. And leave it all documented all and, and then maybe put... That would be the other side of the argument. Mm, yeah. Um, right now, technically we only have to protect up to 50 years. And Oak Creek Canyon, I mean, I wouldn't say pick everything up in the whole world, but Oak Creek Canyon's a unique environment and I think the, the old the settler history is great but I'm not sure that our 1980s and 90s recreational occupation really maximizes the value of Oak Creek Canyon. So I'm happy picking up everything that's not 50 years old. That's a good way to walk that line. <laughs> Now, are, are all of the sites right along the main corridor of Oak Creek, or are there any that go up a little bit farther? Mostly, the rim? there's some sites on the rim, but there's getting cold, and so we don't have a lot. There's there's some, they used to drive their stock up onto the rim in the summers, mm -hmm. and so there are some ranching cabins and corrals and stuff like that. But mostly it's so damn steep that there's, there's kind of a blank area between the rim and the whole steep part. Mm -hmm. All we have is trails that climb up the sides. Um, there are a few cave sites up higher, perhaps, but plus we've never been there. So again, it, this is just an effect of where we've looked, and it's pretty much been on the flats. Um, so if we went looking, who knows what we'd find. But no, it's pretty much all... The flats and the caves right at the edges of the flats is where we find everything. So I did bring, if anyone is a buff or wants to get into it, I have tons of guides of how to measure cans and all kinds of stuff. And then I also 